This is the prayer for completing an icon because at the beginning of one you pray and at the end you pray. So if you turn your paper over, if you could just say with me. You yourself, O Lord, are the fulfillment and completion of all good things. Fill my soul with joy and gladness, for you alone are the lover of humankind. Let your grace sanctify and dwell within this icon, that it may edify and inspire those who gaze upon it and venerate it, that in glorifying the one depicted, they may be repentant of their sins and strengthened against every attack of the adversary. Through the prayers of the Theotokos, the Holy Apostle, and Evangelist Luke, and all the saints, O Savior, save us. Amen. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the sixth and final uh, Lenten luncheon for 2018. Uh, so we can't tell you what's happening next week or invite you back next week, but uh, next year uh, we definitely want you back if we don't see you before that. Next year will be our 38th year of uh, doing this and uh, glad you could all be with us. And uh, we again want to thank uh, Brockton Cable Access for being here to uh, film this so that uh, people around the city and region can uh, see what you're all up to on Wednesdays. Uh, Fridays, yeah, it is Friday, isn't it? Anyway, um, as is tradition on the last uh, one, we pass the basket a second time for additional uh, offerings to Pastor's aid. The ladies out there, uh, they don't get paid for uh, doing this. They do it out of the goodness of their heart as volunteers. The money that uh, you give weekly goes to uh, cover the cost of the food and then they also use it to uh, maintain kitchen equipment, get new kitchen equipment as needed, etc. So uh, we appreciate your generosity and uh, I will also now invite Pastor Jeff to come forward to say grace and also to introduce this week's speaker. And he tells me he might have a joke. Good afternoon. So good to see you. Welcome, welcome to First Lutheran this afternoon. Um, dinner good? Thumbs up? Yeah. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Um, later, in, at the end of things, we're going to um, honor the, our ladies who... Um, who make these wonderful meals for us every week. Um, so we're gonna ask them to come out later at the end of uh, dinner today. Um, I do have a joke. Um, I'm not trying to steal Jim's thunder here, but I only have one joke up my sleeve. And so, it's a riddle actually. So what do you call a sleepwalking nun? Very good! <laughs> a Roman Catholic. <laughs> very cheesy so so just a little cheese today but a religious joke nonetheless an acute one um, anyway um, now um, on to more serious and wonderful things um, pastor Andonine is here with us um, she's the pastor at st. Paul's Lutheran Church in Gloucester and we're very appreciative she made a trek to come see us she's an iconographer and rather than me say what she is or is not I'm gonna let her do that um, Icon, we know in the technological world, is really something we associate with technology or computers, the icons on your desktop, those little tiny screens that allow you to do applications and things like that. And 30 years ago or so, when I was in undergraduate school, I was traveling one day with a friend of mine who was Greek Orthodox in her car, and she had an icon hanging from her rearview mirror and I said oh what a pretty icon she goes you know what that is you know what an icon is and so I just told you that story to see where we have come in culture because that word has become um, obviously a part of secular culture in a way and technological language but its origins it literally means window in Greek and um, but its religious nature and the extraordinary way um, 
we see the heart and mind of God through these extraordinary pictures. I really don't want to say any more because I'll say something wrong. But um, I do have one shameless plug. Um, in about a month, I'm leading um, a workshop for a week at the Synod Camp at Camp Calumet on two of, two of the women that are depicted in icons on this table over here, Hildegard of Bingen and Julian of Norwich, who are both medieval women, but extraordinary um, women in the history of the church. Um, so I'm really honored that Anne was able to come and share this stuff with us. It's, it's not only, it's her spiritual vocation, as well as her, I'll use the word artistry too, because it requires some art, artistic technique. Anyway, enough about me. Please help me in joining, um, welcoming Anne and uh, Denise. Good morning, good afternoon. It's afternoon, right? And now I get, I'm, I'm still on day, what, daylight, it's not saving time. Uh, my name's Ann Deneen, as um, Pastor Jeff has said, and I have been uh, practicing the art of, I don't want to call it an art, the spiritual practice of uh, iconography since uh, 1996. And it, I, enjoyed it and loved it and loved it so much that we now, um, a friend of mine and I for several years offered icon uh, painting workshop at Camp Calumet as well in the middle of winter when no one's there because it's a contemplative practice, um, the, the making of icons. And what I wanted to talk to you about today is a little bit about the spirituality of iconography but also take you through the process of what it is to make an icon, to create one, what, what, what happens with it. It's a very, um, uh, what we would call incarnational practice. It involves uh, wood and layers and layers and layers of, of paint, layers of gesso, it involves uh, prayer, it involves the breath, it, it, it involves the whole person. And uh, it's a very uh, beautiful thing to learn and to do if you ever are so inclined. My own teacher of iconography was named Re Rebecca Taylor Pease, and she lived in Newburyport, and I would go to her house for classes in iconography. She was trained uh, in Orthodox tradition, so her, uh, her icons were in the, the Byzantine tradition, which is, comes out of Constantinople and the Eastern Church and the Eastern Orthodox um, tradition. So she, she uh, used to say that anyone who can write their name can write an icon. And the reason we call it writing an icon, iconography mean, means to write an image, is because it's a form of teaching an icon. It's a form of scripture um, because it's depicting quite often the stories of the Bible, the people of scripture, and um, it, it's a way of teaching uh, people about faith through the gazing or looking at an image that has many, many parts to it. And it, it uh, shapes the imagination, it shapes the religious imagination, and it's understood to be a window to the divine, as Pastor Jeff said. So this is the icon, in some ways, what you're doing is opening a window to a new understanding of God um, as you're working on an icon. So icons are not only depicting images of scripture, of Christ, of Mary, and uh, uh, the disciples, but also of holy people who have lived through time. With the understanding that as you're working on this icon or gazing at it or contemplating it in prayer, you begin to understand something of the character and nature of that person. Um, and, and to uh, take in those qualities to some extent, just like we would uh, somebody we know. We, we have a wonderful theology in Lutheran, uh, the Lutheran Church of the Communion of Saints, and we all know saints who shine for us, right? Everyday saints, people in our lives who shine with the light of God. And an icon is trying to depict the way that God shines through that person's life. So in some ways, almost all of us, you could think of all of us as icons of the divine. Every human person uh, shines with the light of God, and every human person is capable of uh, bringing that light into the world. 
So it's a, a beautiful theology, not only of um, prayer, but also of what it means to be human. When I was first doing icons and learning about painting icon faces, which is quite a process, I began to see people differently. I began to see their faces as icons, and it was, it was really interesting to, to now have that part of me so that you know, there's a, a kind of um, similarity to, to the facial structure, but you can see the lines in the icon, but you also see in each other um, the ways in which we all reflect the divine differently, the similarities and the differences. So this morning, or this afternoon rather, I have some handouts that will help me talk a little bit about the process of making an icon. And the way, uh, first thing you start with when you're learning to paint an icon, of course, like all writing, is a blank piece of paper. Yes. Yes. That's so nice. I'm a teacher's assistant. A TA today. TA. OK. So these are some of the things that my teacher handed on to me, which I'll hand on to you. And they're, they're traditional rules for painting an icon. And as you read through, we'll read them together. As you read through them, you'll see a little bit of the spirituality of it, a little bit of what it means to uh, have a blank uh, board before you that you're going to uh, make a holy image on. The boards in Icon are usually uh, a hardwood board and they are painted with something we call gesso which um, creates a very very smooth surface. Now you've been to paintings, you've seen oil paintings in a museum and there's lots of texture. In an Icon the layers of paint are very very flat. Uh, as you put it on, because you're going to be creating a surface that has a kind of light to it. And the way that's done is through layering, which I'll get to. So uh, I'll show you one of the boards. So it's just, this is a hardwood board. You know, it's a, um, this one is another one you can it's just a piece of wood, and there's something really marvelous about the fact of the wood. You know, it's, it's, it's not canvas, it's not going to break, and it's meant to be held and touched in veneration of icons. You can kiss the icon, but it's not a foreign uh, object that would be a, a, a part, a set apart from your life. It's venerated and beautiful, but it's also very touch, touch, touchable. So when you start an icon, you receive something called a pattern. Now, every icon um, is based on something that went before, just like we receive scripture. So you, we, we all know the, some scriptures that we've memorized. An icon image is one that's handed down through time. And our tradition says, in the iconographic tradition, um, I, I, I didn't want to shout, so I'll come back over here. <laughs> in the tradition of iconography, the first iconographer is said to be St. Luke. And he was supposed to have painted the image of Mary holding Jesus um, from life. And so there's an idea that every image that we paint of Mary holding Jesus goes all the way back to uh, a visual that St. Luke had. So that's a tradition. Is it true? We don't know. But that's what we, we say in the tradition. So these images are handed down from teacher to student, teacher to student, teacher to student. It might be considered an oral tradition, although there's so much that's written about it now, so much that's done. But like, like all um, uh, objects that we create, like all liturgy, it's handed down. And through time, there's changes and adaptations. But the fundamental structure is the same. So if you wanted to start off be, uh, to uh, learn to paint an icon, your teacher would have you do, the, your first image would be the face of Jesus. Because that is the full icon of God for us. Uh, for, for us. And there was a big controversy in the 8th century about making icons and were they um, somehow idolatry. And so there was uh, several arguments about this <laughs> through time and there was a period where all icons were destroyed any kind of imagery was destroyed it's a little like what happened in the reformation and later on when people were destroying church statuary and things like that but 
the, the, I, and that was called uh, iconoclasm. You remember hearing that word? That's where that comes from, from the breaking of the icons. But in the end, the argument was that because Jesus took a human body, that Jesus could be depicted. No one can depict God. No one can paint an image of God because that really would be violating the commandment and also we cannot see God. So for us, Jesus, uh, as Luther used to say, is the mirror of God's face for us. And so we could depict that. So you would receive an icon from your teacher, a picture of one, or you would have the living one in the room, something like this. So this is, this is an icon of the face of Jesus. It's from a much larger icon. And uh, it's from an icon called Jesus the Teacher. And then you would get a pattern. Now, I showed a pattern um, to someone earlier, and, and they said, is it like painting by numbers? And no, it isn't. There are colors that go with certain things, but this has to do with a kind of layering technique. And you receive a pattern, and that's like receiving a piece of scripture. So here's Jesus. He's holding a book. He's got his hand in the teaching position. And he, um, this is also an image you can see in something called Christ Pontecrators. They'll be at the top in the domes of cathedrals. You'll see that. But this is, this is Jesus, and you would spend time praying with this image and this pattern. And if you go to the rules for an icon painter, now you have your blank board and a pattern, and what's next? So the next thing is to pray. How will you receive this? What is it that... Um, as you're painting this, what is it that we, you'll be learning and praying about as you, as you uh, depict the face of Christ? So if you, let's look at these rules for an icon painter. And again, these came to me from my teacher, Rebecca Taylor Pease, and she was given them by her teacher, uh, who, uh, and, it, and so on. So these are, these are traditional rules. And um, maybe you could just go around from, um, I'll just read them. So, <laughs> there. so before starting work, you make the sign of the cross, and you pray in silence, and look, then you forgive your enemies. Because this is to be done in such um, devotion, and then it's just like we do forgiveness before we go to the altar, right, to receive communion. We have, at the beginning of our liturgy, we have uh, the corporate confession and forgiveness. And we do that so that we can go to the altar without an enemy, and we, make, we, we pass the sign of the peace. It's the same movement to forgive our enemies so that we're before God without hostility in our hearts. And then, and then this is one that I love here. Work with care on every detail of your icon as if you were working in front of the Lord himself. Now the thing about that rule is that's true for us anyway, isn't it? in life? Aren't we always working before the Lord? Is there any place we can go in creation where God is not? No. So this is just something we're already doing, working with care at every detail of the icon, just like we work with care in every detail of our lives, um, as if we were in the presence of God. So during the work, you pray to strengthen yourself physically and spiritually. And then this is one of the things about um, doing a class in icons is all my classes were in silence. The only person that talked was the teacher. And occasionally you might have a question. But it's done quietly. And you, you avoid useless words and you keep silence. And I, I, uh, it took us a while to really um, learn the discipline of that. But it helps you concentrate, when you're, especially when you're in a group together and you're doing common work. Uh, in an icon class, for example, you just you don't want to interrupt the work of another person. But avoid useless words and keep silence. We could send that to many people these days, couldn't we? <laughs> so, and then you're going to pray to the saint whose face you're painting and to keep your mind from distraction so that the saint can be close to you. I'm just going to take a little break here to talk about painting a saint. So the last two classes we taught at uh, Calumet, one was on Hildegard of Bingen, and one was on Julian of Norwich. And they were two very, very different icons. 
Um, one is an icon that was based on traditional ones of Julian, but the artist is a contemporary artist, and she adapted it, and she made a much kind of, much more freer, freeform icon, and that's of Julian, so I'll show you that. Julian of Norwich is an English saint, and she lived uh, in what's called an, uh, she became a, an anchorite, and she lived attached to a cathedral in a small cell, and legend is that she had a cat, but she had a series of visions. She was quite ill at one point in her life, and she had a series of visions that uh, helped her understand who God was, and the nearness of Christ, and to look upon the face of Christ. And people loved her and would come to her window, it said, to receive advice. So this is a picture adapted of, uh, from Julian iconography. There's many, many images of Julian. In the, um, and you, if you had time and wanted to go on Google and type in Julian of Norwich iconography, you would get hundreds of different images of her. But this one is by a, a woman in... Uh, Michigan, her name is Virginia Waringa, and we asked permission if we could do it because all of us love the playfulness of it. Julian says that she, in all of her life, could never find any anger in God, and she experienced God as a joyful presence, and you can see that in this icon. So this has pieces of her story in it, as every icon does. She was Benedictine, and she was uh, a hermit, if you not a hermit, an anchorite. And there's the cat in the story. She's holding in her hand something called a hazelnut because she had a vision of a hazelnut in the palm of God's hand and saw that the entire of all creation was in the hazelnut. That was one of her showings, one of her visions. She's also known for saying something uh, that all would be well. Have you ever heard that expression? All shall be well, and all shall be well, and all shall be very well. That was part of one of her showings, too, and she had great confidence uh, in final outcomes. So when we painted it, we got a board and we adapted it. We figured out what the colors were. Um, these icons that I have done are using contemporary materials, but in early icons, the earliest ones uh, were painted with something called encaustic, which was hot wax with pigment, pigments uh, melted into them. So the wax was melted and the pigments were swirled into them. So early, early icons were painted with encaustic. And one of the earliest ones, one's, one that survived the iconoclastic period in the 8th century, is still in existence at St. Catherine's uh, Monastery um, in the Sinai. Uh, so you could go for a very long journey and see a very, very early icon, and that's an icon of Jesus. So these are contemporary materials that we use. I use acrylics, and my teacher said to me that if those guys had acrylics, they would have used them, because they, the tradition, like all traditions, they use what technology they have at the time. So encaustic then went to egg tempera, and egg tempera has evolved. Some people still do egg tempera, some people do encaustic, and some people use acrylics, and I'm, I was trained with acrylics, so that's what I use. Anyway, so this one isn't finished when I'm teaching them um, icons. I usually don't have time to finish my own, but this one is adapted from, from Virginia Warangas, and you can see that there's a lot to do yet. But generally, an icon will take 40 to 60 hours of painting, and that's because everything on here is layered. So you start off um, using the darkest pigments first, because in the, in the understanding of light in the, in the world of the icon, the light always comes out of the darkness. So rather than the dark illuminating the, I mean the light illuminating the dark, the light emerges from darkness. And uh, you float, literally float layers and layers and layers of pigments on top of each other to create that sense of light. So just one sec. This is a, a finished icon, and you can see, this is the darkest here, here there's a cave, and then the very, um, and everything gets layered up from that. The lower, the lower um, portion of this is some trees and water, 
And if you look at it closely, you'll see that underneath the lighter pigments are flat, dark surfaces. So the first thing you do with an icon is you paint in all of the darkest pigments. So you'll paint in, um, you'll paint in this darkness here, you paint in the background of the mountains, you paint in the, the flat color for the, um, the trees, but it, it's many layers because you use very, very thin layers of paint mixed with water or whatever your medium is and, it's, and you let each layer dry. And one of the ways you can help it to dry is to breathe on the icon. So while it's, you do your layers and then you breathe, just like that, so your breath helps the paint dry and then your breath gets to be part of the icon do part of this living piece of wood um, that's here. So then as you're going along, you begin, to, um, you, you begin to build up a surface still very flat because of the thinness of the layers. And a face, for example, this is the face of Ezekiel, uh, Elijah, sorry, <laughs> getting my saints wrong. And the, very, the color at the bottom of a face for any icon is a, a mix of paints called Sankir. And it's a mix that looks like mud. It, it really looks like mud. It's kind of an icky green, dark color. And then you layer more pigment on top of it to build a kind of structure of a face. But I always love that because it takes you back to when God made humankind, God picked up some clay or some mud literally and mixed it up with breathed life into it and so an icon the icon uh, has that in it that teaching about what it means to come out of creation so in painting julian um, we spent time learning about her life and then this year when we were painting hildegard we spent time learning out about her life she is here. Hildegard was a marvelous, uh, wonderful saint and is now uh, the Catholics, uh, Roman Catholic Church has made her a doctor of the church. She is, uh, grew up in Germany and she had a beautiful theology of creation, wonderful theology of creation. She was a healer. She uh, gave lots of advice to dignitaries and leaders, religious leaders, popes, kings. People came to her and she um, was also a composer and a poet, so she was, yes. I must add too, she's the first person in Western music that we know composed by name. All composition before her was anonymous. She's the first composer in music in the West by name. So the first composer in the Western musical canon is a woman, not a man. <laughs> okay, and so that's the point. So you study her first when you study music history. That's great. So there she is. And um, there are all these different pieces of her story here. Uh, and the lily, for example, is her perpetual virginity. It's also Mary. Um, this is the Holy Spirit speaking into her ear. There's um, flowers on her, um, not a crown, it's holding her uh, veil. But she, and this, this sense of the world is full of greening life, she called it. Veriditas is the greening power of life. So you learn about the saint as you're, as you're painting it, and you begin to, it's, 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 a, it's another way of taking in the great teachings of the church, and you're doing it through an image, um, and learning about the image, and thinking about it, and praying about it. And they're all exemplars, of course, of, of Christian faith. Um, So let's go back to the rules of icon. So we're prayed to the saint whose face we're painting. If we're painting Christ, we would have been praying uh, about to Jesus. And we keep our mind from distractions. Now, here's one of the really interesting parts of doing iconography. When you have to choose a color, stretch out your hands interiorly to ask the Lord his counsel. In iconography, there's traditions of color. Every color has meaning because everything in there is meaning bearing. There's nothing random. There's no random lines. Um, there's no uh, non-meaning bearing uh, painting uh, in the icon. So, so for example, if you're painting a saint like um, who is not uh, associated with the divine birth of Jesus, 
They often will be in red or in green or a combination of both. So in the icon of Mary and Elizabeth, Elizabeth wears a kind of earthy reddish green and uh, a, a, a earthy red color and green. But Mary is clothed in blue and red. And Mary will always be clothed in an icon in blue and red, some kind of blue. And you'll see that if you look at these books here, or some of them, or even the, this is an icon of Mary that I've been working on called the icon of the sign. It's not finished. But you can see the layering process if you look at it. But this is a symbol, the red cloak is a symbol of her humanity, and the blue is a symbol of her divinity. And then when you're looking at an icon of Jesus, you'll see red and blue also used. And sometimes the blue is on the outside for Jesus as a symbol, again, of Jesus' humanity and Jesus' divinity. So those are colors associated with that. Um, excuse me. So then, um, but there's other things that you can think about in an icon there. Maybe there's some variations on prayer, but you pray about the color. So everything that you do is swathed in prayer. Um, when I do my own icons, I've done a couple, a few original icons, ones that I didn't have patterns for, but that I learned about a saint um, and made a pattern. One was for St. Ansgar up at, uh, in Portland, Maine, for St. Ansgar Lutheran Church. I made a St. Ansgar icon. There's many, many patterns of St. Ansgar, but I wanted to make one for that. So that was an original one. So I did a lot of praying about what the colors were <laughs> in that one. And I, if you, I couldn't figure out what Ansgar would have worn. He lived in the ninth century, and I wasn't sure what Benedictine robes looked like. Um, so I just, it was very, I, uh, what they call anachronistic, and looks like um, contemporary Benedictine robes, but what are you going to do? Are we running out of time? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but, no. Um, I, did, I don't want to be rude or anything about that. Um, as you can tell, if I may steal your thunder. Yes. Um, this is an extraordinary thing. I mean, that began centuries, millennium ago, and it, to talk about it in 25 minutes just doesn't even scratch the surface. You don't even take your fingernails out yet. So um, what we wanted you to have a chance to is to look at all these wonderful resources. Anne or myself can stick around. I know about this much about iconography. She knows this much about iconography. And we're happy to talk through the ones that are up here. There's symbolism. You'll see even one of J.S. Bach, Johann Sebastian Bach, who is um, not <laughs> a part of the divine offspring of Christ. Um, but he has been depicted because of his divinity, not his divinity, but what he, how he points to the divine. And that's what an icon does. It points to things that are divine and a window through them. So there's one of Bach, there's one, if you look at these contemporary books, there are uh, modern day saints that some of which are even not even Christian, identified as Christian. It's an amazing art form, it's an amazing spirituality. Um, we need to, Jim, can you call our ladies in? Um, also, um, I have on the piano over there, uh, speaking of icons, icons and sound, we have uh, a compact disc that we made this past summer for celebrating the 150th anniversary of uh, First Lutheran. Um, if you don't have a compact disc of our celebration, it has lots of organ offerings, including the renowned organist Peter Sykes is on it. And um, it also has um, myself playing as well as the choir singing trumpet, um, trumpet music. So if you would like a copy of that sort of icon in sound, its name is Thine Be the Glory, Please See Me. We'd love for you to have a, uh, one of our CDs. Um, please make, uh, if you haven't found Holy Week plans and Easter plans, you're more than welcome to be with us. We have Palm Sunday, um, Monday, Thursday, we have a morning service and an evening service with a Passover supper, Good Friday's Tenebrae, and obviously Easter Sunday at 7.45 a.m. and 9 a.m. So I hope you have um, wonderful, wonderful Easter plans. So um, I would like to thank, as they come out, our wonderful chefs and hosts here at First Lutheran. Um, they're still piling in, and we have people that are not here. They've been doing this for, for uh, how many of you have been doing it for 38 years, 37 years? Elsa. Elsa. Elsa has. The okay. one that has is Elsa. She's out in the kitchen, uh, kitchen, kitchen. because she's a little out of breath right now. So, so anyway. And, uh, so we she have, is 91. 
Stop and say hello to us. Yes. <laughs> so we have flowers for them. And um, I would love for you to spend some time with Anne because uh, what an extraordinary gift, as especially we go into Holy Week, to have something to look at um, that points to Jesus. So, ladies, thank you for your hard work. And help me in thanking them by giving them a big round of applause.